Hello friends, this is Greg Braden here, and today I am thrilled and honored and really excited to have as our special guest, my dear friend, uh, Nassim Harmon. We, uh, we have known one another now, we've calculated about 30 years, and uh, this year in 2022. And in those 30 years, we have shared our, our love and our passion for exploring the mysteries of the universe, and the, the secrets that the universe holds. Today, uh, we have the, the privilege of spending some time with Nassim. He is uh, in a, uh, a location in Europe, he's in France, and we're doing this through satellite. So you're going to see a little bit of a delay in the, uh, in the connection, and I just wanted to say that right up front. Nassim, my dear friend, my brother, it's good to see you. Welcome to this community and to this course, a five-year guide to your future we're sharing new discoveries that give people new ways to think about themselves, their relationship to the world, and what's possible in the world over these next five years, uh, specifically in between now and, and 2030. And we've just completed a course on energy, uh, the energy that uh, is conventional energy that we're using now, the, the deep truth of what is being called green energy, and and why it, it cannot be the answer to the world's energy needs because it is fossil fuel intensive to create based upon rare earth elements that are in, in short supply. We talked about uh, thorium as a, uh, as a stepping stone, as a bridge to cutting the greenhouse gases and energy now, a stepping stone to an ultimate form of energy. Nassim, that I, I think we all know in our hearts and we suspect in our minds is possible and uh, my brother, you are the, the expert. You are the, the, the one person I know in the world that has dedicated his entire life to, to understanding the deep mysteries of the past and how they open the door to the understandings of the, the technologies for our future, including the, the power of this energy. So what I'd like mm -hmm. to do, I, one of the first questions that people always ask is how is it possible to, to derive energy from what we used to think of as, as empty space. And if you could just uh, talk to us a little bit about that from, from your perspective, how is it possible that, that something like energy can be derived from what we've all been taught to think of as nothing? If you're comfortable sharing right. a little bit about that. Well, it's a, it's a really good question because um, it, um, it actually is a misnomer uh, in the question, meaning that there is no such thing that we've been able to observe as empty space. Uh, and, and so nothing like that has ever been found and we've looked, you know. Um, like if, for instance, if you think of the largest vacuum we know of, for instance, the space between galaxies, well, even in that space, you find there's particles every few centimeters, right? So, it's, so it's actually quite full. Um, but if you if you were to look at the quantum space, right, like the space in the atom, for instance, where the atom is made out of ninety nine point nine 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 percent space, so like all of your reality, all of the things you call things are actually made out of space. Well, when you look at that space, it's not empty at all. It's full of energy. It's full of fluctuation, electromagnetic fluctuation. So the concept of empty space is really not adequate. Um, it, it really doesn't exist. And uh, it might be hard for people to visualize. So like, let me give you an example. Like, the space around you right now is full of electromagnetic fields. There's radio waves, there's microwaves, there's, you know, uh, ultraviolet, there's infrared, there's even background radiation from the so-called Big Bang, there's, uh, there's radiation from the galaxy we're in, there's radiation from all kinds of different sources. And so actually the space we're in is full of energy. And we discovered these energies throughout history. We didn't know they were there earlier on. 
Uh, we didn't know x-rays. We didn't know ultraviolet. We didn't know all kinds of different wavelengths of energies we didn't we didn't discover until later on and um and basically we use these energies we use these different electromagnetic waves to transmit information and to transmit power in some cases and so on and so it really is not um unusual to think that there is energy in space in the space now the difference is that this source of energy we're discussing is actually a source of energy that comes from the most fundamental fluctuation of creation like it's quantum fluctuation it's energy it's wavelengths that are so teeny they're smaller than the atom itself they're smaller than the nuclei of the atom they're really teeny fluctuations in the structure of the vacuum. But because they're teeny, there's a lot of them and they're really energetic. And so when you calculate how much energy there is in the quantum vacuum, in the space, in like the quantum structure or in the atom or in the proton or whatever, you find that it's huge. It's like, 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube. So it's the mass of the universe is 10 to the 55 grams. So it's more than the mass or the energy of the universe in a centimeter cube of space by 39 orders of magnitude larger. So, um, so you can imagine that if you tap one tenth of a billionth of a percent of that energy, um, then it really is enough energy to run the planet for thousands of years. Um, so it really is a matter of understanding that energy and understanding how to tap into it. And that actually is not that hard. Ah, okay. Well, I, I know that I've, well, first, thank you for, for that explanation. And I, I've heard you share statistics in the past. There's enough energy in a cubic centimeter. It's about the size of a sugar cube to power, uh, to, to power us for a long time. Can you just help our, our, our viewers just with a little bit of, of a comparison, how, how much energy, what, what could we power with the energy that's in that cubic centimeter? Can you give us some idea? Um, we could power all of our planet for millions and millions and millions of years, because like I was saying, there's more energy in that centimeter cube than all of the energy that you find in the universe, in the observable universe anyway. Um, and so um, it's enormous. Um, you could boil all the waters in the world, for instance, all of the oceans, uh, you could boil them dry, um, you know, no problem with that centimeter cube of energy, um, you know, so you could melt the planet. I mean, it's, it's uh, it's enormous, um, and and we don't need to tap all of the energy that's in a centimeter cube of space. If we have an efficiency of a billionth of a percent of what's there, we we can power everything we need for eternity. And and I want to mention as well that it's not just about power; it's about our capacity as well to. Uh, manipulate or control gravitational field because with this level of power comes the capacity to curve space-time and create warp drives and so on, which that might sound really out there, but there's sections of NASA working on this right now um, and so on. So, I mean, there is uh, serious science being done in that field. Yeah, well, I, and that ties directly into to the next question I wanted to ask, Nassim. You, you and I, we often talk about the uh, first time we met physically was in a little cafe in, uh, in northern New Mexico. 
uh, when you were on a, a cross continent mm -hmm. odyssey <laughs> and uh, yes yeah and I a was great journey well and it was interesting because we were both uh, 30 years ago we had uh, uh, both of us had longer hair 30 years ago for sure <laughs> but what's interesting is we were yeah. both I had more hair well I did too I, I did too <laughs> and, and, my, and mine was darker <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> we, we were both passionate about, about helping the people of this world, about helping our global family find a way to navigate the challenges and the crises that were happening at that time and that we also knew, we knew that we were going to run into some difficult times in the years ahead. And we both felt that the one of the pathways to revealing new discoveries whether it comes to energy or healing or you know so many of the things we've talked about was in the past and understanding our past and the nature of the wisdom of of many of the ancient traditions who in one way or another unlocked some of these secrets and applied them in in their own ways so I'm wondering, can, can you share with our, our viewers a little bit about the role of ancient wisdom and ancient principles of geometry, for example, and uh, some of the mysteries of the past and how those have helped to, to guide the, the high tech that uh, is, is available to us today to arrive at, at the discoveries that you're making right now? Well yeah i mean there's many ways you can think of it but there's one thing that's for sure is that from the studies i did and you did of ancient civilization which really inspired me some of the work you did uh in that field um you, you find that many civilizations all around the world uh that supposedly had no contact with each other all knew about this fundamental energy at the base of creation from all from what which all matter emerge and return um, and they called it different ways they called it chi mana prana all kinds of different things but they all talked about it they talked about it as it was very similar to a fluid um, that concept eventually even made it into physics for many, many years uh, and uh, was called the ether. Um, you know, um, the Maxwell field equations originally were written with the concept of an ether. The ether would be the carrier of the electromagnetic waves and so on. And, and, and eventually, uh, it was replaced by space-time uh, by Einstein, uh, in, and it became a conceptual mathematical model. Uh, although Einstein agreed with it at the beginning, eventually, 10 years later, he changed his opinion and, and made very clear statement that relativity, general relativity, um, has no meaning without an ether, without this fundamental energy source. Um, and it really is, uh, you know, uh, present in quantum physics and quantum field theory today. Still, it's called quantum vacuum fluctuation. So it, it actually changed names throughout, and and the formalism became more obscure, and uh, it became difficult to to talk about it like 25 years ago when you and I were hanging out uh, 40, uh, 30 years ago and so on, they, you know, it was almost taboo to talk about vacuum uh, fluctuations, quantum vacuum fluctuations. Um, although they were very much present in the equations of quantum field theory and were required for many different a mechanism in quantum physics. The, the numbers are so enormous that in general, physicists said it, it, it's either wrong or it's, um, or it's, it's, um, it all cancels out because all the waveform cancels out and we can ignore it. And so 
uh, at the time, there was no physical measurement of this energy. But eventually, in the, in the 90s, uh, there was measurements that were done called the Casimir effect, and then the dynamical Casimir effect, and then other measurements that were done actually cosmologically, um, and, and so on. And, and so um, this energy is, is very much there. It's very much present. And, um, and the, the, the ancient people knew about it. They knew it was the source of matter. And then I wrote physics that proves that, that supports that the, the proton, the electrons, the neutron, all these stuff actually emerge from the vacuums. It's, it's not separate from the vacuum. Which is, a con which is a conclusion that Einstein came up with as well, is that objects are not separated from space, yeah. they're an extension of space. That, that's literally what he discussed. And, um, and so that we're part of the space, if you'd like to think of it. And ancient people didn't only just know about it. And, and I want to make clear that they said they got this information from very advanced gods that came to the earth and all this stuff. But as well, they, they yeah. knew that it had some geometric component to it, that there was some geometric uh, symbolism that you could express that actually describe the workings of this energy and how it coheres, how it uh, becomes self-organized to produce matter and the forces of nature and the constants of, the, of nature and so on. And so I was really intrigued. And, I, and, and the first time I met you, you start to pull out some symbology from ancient civilization and, uh, and crop circles as well and all kinds of cool stuff that is like, oh, wow, I, I, just, I just loved it. Uh, and uh, it kind of launched me on, uh, on trying to like see the relationship uh, between these symbols and uh, advanced physics. And eventually I wrote physics um, that, uh, if, that just actually recently in the paper I'm writing right now kind of linked back up to some of these ancient symbols like in an amazing way. Um, and I, I didn't do it on purpose. It just, it, the equations just led to this and, and it unifies the forces of nature wow. It, uh, it gives an explanation for all of matter production, including stars and galaxies and so on. Like it explains the scales. So all scales, all forces and all constants all unify under this geometric understanding of this fundamental structure of space. Wow, that's so exciting just to, just to hear you talk about this, Nassim. And and that, that first meeting that we had, I had just come back from my first trip uh, to Egypt. And we had the opportunity to, to go into uh, a few temple sites that had only been recently opened uh, during, during that time. And uh, that's where we found mm -hmm. the, the, what we now call sacred geometry. The flower of life certainly was, was etched into some of the temple walls, as well as what we now recognize as circuit diagrams, the Egyptologists thought they were just patterns. They were just uh, designs, pretty patterns. And we had engineers with us that recognize, recognized them as, as circuit diagrams. And, you know, at, one of the things that, that was so fascinating to me when I was there the very first time in Saqqara, for example, is that the, uh, the records show that when Napoleon's army opened one of the temples underground in Saqqara, it was underground, but it was completely illuminated by spheres that were sitting on pedestals uh, that were just glowing light and apparently had been for a couple of thousand years. There were no batteries. There was nothing plugged in <laughs> to run, running them. And uh, so my question, I said, well, where are those spheres? And then what, what the records show is uh, when Napoleon's army went in with the horses, the horses knocked these things over and they broke all of the spheres. But it, it's believed that there was some uh, a gas that had been uh, uh, created based on the principles we're talking about now in resonance 
with forces from the earth that were allowing this perpetual glow. And that was just one example of, you know, where it's clear that they had some technology uh, thousands of years ago that we're only beginning to understand. I think the word you just used, uh, resonance, I think is a really, really important part of understanding this energy and the creation of matter and how to extract energy from this source and um, how to become resonant, sympathetically resonant to the rest of the universe. <laughs> Yeah, well, absolutely. This is just what I was going to say, because all of the discoveries you're making, Nassim, and I'm, I'm only aware of, uh, of some of them. I know you've made new discoveries recently that you and I haven't even had the opportunity to, to talk about yet. But what's so fascinating to me is all the things you're discovering about our universe apply to us as, uh, as biological beings, because we are the field and we are uh, subject to all of the principles, the holographic principle, the entanglement, the fractal principles, all the resonant principles. So you're not only discovering uh, ways that we can improve our technological lives, but you are by default discovering ways that we can improve our, our everyday lives, our health, our healing, our emotional health, our psychological health, certainly our physiological health. And, uh, and those applications, I think, are just as exciting as, as the potential for bringing a form of energy to the people of this earth that free them from the bonds and from the shackles of the greed and the fear that has limited humankind for thousands of years. And, and I, I believe that's precisely what these kinds of discoveries uh, are doing and have the potential to do to an even greater degree. So I, I wanna thank you for dedicating your life and all the ways that you have to to arriving where you are now yeah. and so my my last question Nassim, where are we and uh, to the degree that you can talk about this I'm, I'm just curious where are we in terms of bringing these discoveries uh into our lives locally uh what some people would say on a commercial basis in terms of of, uh, and I, I don't know that it needs necessarily replace everything that we have now, but certainly to uh, support and supplement the kinds of energy that, that we have in the world now. Can you talk about that? Are you, are you comfortable talking about that? Sure. Um, yeah, like there is, let's just say that, um, and, and there's actually quite a bit of publicity about this right now. Um, there is, and because there's other people uh, like us that are working on this, um, you know, um, and uh, Stephen Greer is one of them and so on. And, and so there is uh, developments of these technologies, technical developments of these technologies that have been successful all around the world uh, at different times of history, uh, going at least all the way back to um you know tesla and others at the time and and forward as well um there's multiple inventors and scientists that have been successful uh at extracting some of that energy and i i would even uh, venture to say that um the early tests that were successful with uh, what was called at the time uh, cold fusion were some of the first um, experiment that supported, um, you know, the extraction of this energy. Um, interestingly, it was poo pooed at the time, but um, and it was it was crashed by by hot fusion guys. Uh, but um, the you know currently there's international scientific. Uh, meetings that are occurring in Europe that are sponsored by most of the countries in Europe in the development of that very technology. It's no longer, you know, um, you know, a fringe uh, scientific venture to 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 attempt these uh, to reproduce these these technology, and some of them have been reproduced very successfully uh, and are about to be mm. launched in some countries. Um, so um, I think we're actually really, really close. 
Um, and uh, certainly we're arriving at a place in our history where um, we have to transcend the way we've been producing energy and using energy uh, and that this transition is difficult, not because there's not the technological know-how, but because there is a problem with the um, financial and political and um, in, uh, international, you know, military industrial complex and so on that is creating some large difficulties in, in bringing this to bear and to market. So, um, you know, it really is up to the population and to us to like make the difference uh, and, and to bring that to bear. Um, and, and so it really is our level of interest, our level of education and, you know, understanding the transformation that this will bring to humanity. Like you said, it's not just energy powering our cars and houses and all this, but this is energy that's at the base of creation. That's at the base of life itself. Um, and it can have huge uh, impact on health and uh, 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 life extension and, and our capacity to uh, travel in this in the universe uh, in our solar system in our galaxy and so on and and so it really is a critical turn that we're you know very nexus point in humanity's evolution right now to bring that forward and the problem is again is not a technical or scientific problem um, you know it's it's uh, being able to overcome the inertia of uh, earlier technologies that uh, are uh, still hanging on to uh, continue to um, to dominate markets. Wow, this is so exciting to, to hear this, Nassim, and I appreciate you sharing that. And you know, I think one of the things that I certainly have recognized as a scientist going to the, uh, the scientific conferences and, and in the scientific papers, is there is an openness and a willingness to accept these concepts more so now than there was when you and I were meeting and certainly in Taos, New Mexico 30 years ago. But one of the things that has changed is that the yeah. energy companies, the oil companies now are actually supporting this technology. Some of them are. And, and the reason is fascinating because they are now recognizing that petroleum products uh, oil is one of the compounds that we cannot synthetically reproduce from nothing. So what that means is the oil that we have is so precious. Once it's gone, it's gone, and we have to stop burning it so that we can still continue to use it to create the computers that we're talking on right now and all the medical supplies and the medical equipments. And, you know, there are 6,000 applications in each of our lives every day where fossil fuels are involved and people don't realize that. So it, it is so precious that we need to stop burning it and go to these alternatives mm -hmm. and the oil. It's not about putting the energy companies out of business. Uh, although, you know, I mean, some people think that that's, that's what's happening, but it's the recognition that we're at a point in our civilization where we need the, the oil as a resource uh, in the technology and that we can create energy in other ways without destroying that that finite resource so that's uh, for me that's yeah, very exciting only, so, yeah 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 not only not destroy the environment but actually rejuvenate the the environment because at that having an almost infinite amount of energy available to us would allow us to greenify deserts and you know purify water and and so on I, like there's all kinds of application in which our world could really be thriving as a result yeah well and and it would also free the innovation and the creativity and the imagination of so much of our global family who has been sidelined uh, in those endeavors because uh, because they don't have access to the kind of energy that we're talking about. So it would unleash mm -hmm. the, 
the creative forces of our uh, human intellect and imagination in ways that we've never seen. And I mean, that's so exciting. So, Sam, uh, we're, we're going to wrap up this conversation. And the last thing I want to ask you, how could people get involved if they want to be involved and really support what you're doing, if they want to support uh, the movement toward uh, encouraging our communities and our leaders to embrace these technologies. Can you recommend any anything that people can do just to to stay uh, informed, to stay current, and to stay involved? Um, yeah, of course. You know, they they can um, they can actually register that the Resonance Science Foundation. They can um, so that Resonance Science org and they can take our online course which is free uh, and is quite extensive we're going to publish a new section as soon as my latest paper which i'm really excited about comes out and then um, there is um, you know other organizations and so they we publish uh weekly articles and so on to like stay in touch with the latest news and then as well, you know, there's other organization, like I was talking about Stephen Greer and so on, that are making strong efforts in, in liberating these type of technologies and so on. And so they can get involved there too. Um, they can support us in any way they can, you know, um, and contact us if they can help support us, you know, in all kinds of different ways, technically or financially or any other way and you know like get involved but as well and I think that's really important and probably most um, relevant to to the people that are listening um, right now is to become aware of this energy within themselves and to start, you know, interacting with it consciously, because it's not only in the space outside of you, it's in the space inside of you, which is 99.99999% yeah. .99 space again. And, and so, you know, to actually start to feel it, and to be architects of it, you know, to be engineers of your vacuum energy, uh, and to direct it to be to your to help your health, your your awareness, your consciousness, and everything. I think that's really uh, important. And just to do that, even five minutes a day, uh, every day, would make a huge difference because we're all connected through this energy, and everybody that becomes better at channeling it is is making a difference, a, a huge difference. Wow. Well, thank you, Sam. We'll make sure that people have uh, all the links they need to to stay current with you and uh, and the Residence Foundation. So, Nassim, I know it's it's late where you are. I, I just so appreciate you sharing a part of your day with us, sharing your your discoveries. Uh, I hope you can feel the love that's coming to you from certainly from me, my brother, because I I, I do love you so much for your your passion, your beautiful mind, uh, your, your brilliant heart that has pushed forward all these years when and sometimes it would be easier not to, but you are persevering through uh, everything it takes to bring these discoveries forward. And the bottom line is we're gonna be better people and we're gonna have a, a better world for your efforts. So I know I speak for everyone in this community when I say thank you, uh, you have our love and our appreciation and um, I look forward to our next. Just save me a hug when I get onto your continent, and uh, and best of luck with all the, the new discoveries. And we're looking forward to that paper. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Greg. It's so great to talk to you always. Uh, so much love to you as well on your amazing journey. And like together, uh, we together we're doing it. We're changing it all together. Like it's amazing and. Um, and it's about connection and it's about staying connected and staying strong together. Uh, and I can't say uh, how mm. much I appreciate uh, all your efforts throughout the years to help, um, you know, with all of the research and as well the education. And it's so critical uh, because 
at this time in history, it's really critical that people see a future and have and see the light at the end of the tunnel. And and hopefully you, you and I can, you know, can help uh, kind of shine a little bit of light in the tunnel. I love that you say that. That's what this course is all about, a five year guide to your future. And you have just given us a, a, a beautiful vision of what uh, we know in our hearts is possible, but you really help our minds to accept how real it can be in our everyday lives. So thank you so much, Nassim. Have a beautiful rest of the evening. Take good care. We love you. And please give our love to everybody uh, working with you that make everything possible. Okay.